So I just wanted to spend a few minutes with you. I know it's a huge topic and really hard to yeah. <laughs> boil down in such a small amount of time, but if you could just sort of give me an overview of <laughs> how, <laughs> how, how is history, in a nutshell, formed, um, how I think about my faith and how I live mm. it out. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Obviously huge questions. Right. And actually, um, for a British person to talk, be talking to an American person about this is already a little tricky because <laughs> quite a large swathe of American culture back in the 17th and 18th century consisted of disaffected Brits mm -hmm. who had been fed up here gone to the new world to say now at last we can practice our faith properly right. so <laughs> there's always that sort of sense of don't you Brits come over here and tell us how to do it because we got rid of you some while ago <laughs> and there was this funny thing called a war of independence if I remember right I've 200, heard of it. 230 years yeah. ago whenever it was <laughs> 40 um, and so already we have uh, shared history which warps our sense of perceptions. Mm. And uh, I've been aware of that once or twice when I've been in Edinburgh, in, Edinburgh, in America. Mm. Um, one time when I was a visiting um, a professor at Harvard, I had to preach in Harvard Memorial Chapel and I'd been doing some homework and discovered that a, a great, 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 great uncle of mine had been the first chaplain of Harvard University, which I'd never known before and that he was a royalist, he was in favor of King George. And then when the glorious revolution happened, he was on the boat back home yeah. and <laughs> finished his days as a canon of St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, and I thought, yeah, this is kind of funny and here am I now. Yes. So let's, let's just sort of name all that okay. right off the top okay. um, because nothing that I say is intended to be a, a, a criticism of one particular nation or culture. And I do want to say as well, um, God moves in many mysterious ways and if God was waiting for us to get all the answers right before God could ever uh, live within our lives and work through us and establish a relationship with us, God would be waiting a long time and we'd all be in a big mess um, so that everything that any of us say, however well-tuned and accurate and biblically shrewd, etc., is still some way down the mountain from where, say, the Archangel Gabriel sees things. Right, right, right. Um, so. Um, I sometimes say this to students when they say, how can I ever get my head around this? And I say, well, look, you know, here's this vast mountain. I may be a little bit further up than you simply because I'm older and have studied a few more texts, but we're all climbers. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just agree we're on a shared journey. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I don't know very much about Eastern Orthodox Christianity. I know a bit, but most of what I know is about the Western tradition, which is that after the split roughly a thousand years ago of East and West, then what we now think of as the Roman Catholic Church became the dominant force. Mm -hmm. And in uh, Western Europe, uh, that was so until the Reformation of the 16th century, um, and which was a hugely turbulent thing. Throughout that Middle Age period, there were various theological streams, but among the great influences on them were the great Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And there's an awful lot of Plato in Western medieval thought, mm -hmm. which is still in Western thought to this day. Now, Plato, the great Greek philosopher, roughly 400 years before Jesus, um, Plato believed that though the material world wasn't exactly a bad and dark and terrible place, it wasn't the reality. It was just a shadow of the reality. Mm -hmm. And really, we humans had souls, which were something n not a bodily thing, but, mm -hmm. but which belonged to us, as it were, or at least we had them on temporary loan until they then wanted to go back home where they'd come from, yeah. namely to heaven. Yeah. And that's an idea that's deep in the Platonic tradition, both in Plato himself, in the Middle Platonism of the first century, in the Neoplatonism of the fourth, fifth centuries. And to this day, many, if not most Western Christians, assume that the purpose of religion of whatever sort is, quote, to go to heaven when you die. And indeed, to challenge that, mm -hmm. rather, as you said, mm -hmm. makes people think, oh dear, this right. person's a heretic, it's yeah. terrible. So all the alarms um, start Yeah, going up. exactly. Well, I know that, I know that perfectly well. But that's the funny thing. Right off the top, I want to say that the great story of the Bible is about God making a world where God wants to come and live with his human creatures. And he makes us in his image so that it's appropriate for him to come and share our life. Um, and that is still mind blowing to me. I've been thinking about this for a long time because it demands that we think differently about, about God, about yeah. who God is. But that leads to the, the next thing along because from about the 14th century, that is the um, 
uh, no, but sorry, the, the, the 15th century, that's the 1400s, as opposed to the Reformation period, which is the 16th century, the 1500s, you get a revival of the ancient philosophy of Epicureanism. Mm. And for Epicurus, unlike most other people in the ancient world, because he wasn't the most popular philosopher by any means, um, if the gods exist, gods plural, they're a long, long way away from us. They have nothing to do with us. We have nothing to do with them. So that instead of gods having a finger in every pie, which was what ancient paganism seemed to think, um, no, we don't need to worry about that. They're a long way away. Nothing we can do affects them. So the world just makes itself under its own steam. It's all a matter of atoms bumping into each other mm -hmm. and doing new things. And so this is quite a convenient philosophy for the rich and well-to-do, which mm -hmm. it was in the ancient world. And it's interesting that it becomes popular in Europe just when Europe is becoming what we now call the first world, mm -hmm. when through its exploration, through its culture, through its uh, science and technology, it, as it were, elevates itself, or if it is an elevation, um, above the rest of the world. And guess what? We become Epicurean, mm -hmm. and so we tend to favor um, theories about the world making itself, in other words, evolution, as that evolutionism um, starts way before Charles Darwin. Mm -hmm. um, and all Charles Darwin does is he goes on a boat and he finds some finches and tortoises and goodness knows what else to provide some sharp examples mm -hmm. of the way in which species seem to have evolved according to their conditions. And I know this is hugely controversial in America, but I want to say, as far as I can see, biological evolution is a fact. Evolutionism mm -hmm. is a philosophical theory which actually goes with the ancient Epicureanism. You know, it, it, this was not a new idea in the 19th century. And it's all to do then with whether the being we call God, if we do call a being God, has any part to play in the system or not. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was going on in Epicureanism was we don't actually want God on site because we are strong now, we mm -hmm. are independent. So you get this thing called the Enlightenment in the 18th century, which is a way of saying, we're going to kick God upstairs. You can go and visit him if you want, like a nice old elderly relative. Go and see him on Sundays, mm -hmm. and he'll be glad about that. Mm -hmm. But then come back to the real world right. um, and where we all live. And uh, so that goes with historical skepticism, particularly in the 18th century, which then affects how many in Europe and America read their Bibles. Oh, we can't believe that sort of thing anymore. You can't believe that Jesus walked on water. Mm -hmm. Can't believe that a human being could be divine or that God would become human. You know, We now know that that's impossible, which means with our newly enlightened version of Epicureanism, um, we've ruled it out before mm -hmm. we even start investigating. Mm -hmm. So what then happens, alas, is that instead of saying, wait a minute, the Bible has a much better metaphysic than that, a much better idea of how heaven and earth would go together than that. Many, many devout Christians in the 19th century, the Victorian period, in Britain and America and elsewhere, went back to Plato mm. and talked in terms of the soul. And actually, we do have a soul that is in touch with, even if, but often they kept the distant God, mm -hmm. either an Epicurean God, but he shouldn't really be having anything to do with this, or perhaps a deist God, because deism is like a slightly more friendly version of Epicureanism. You've got a God, probably just one God, um, who is quite a way away, doesn't normally interfere, but probably is looking down and checking us out and wondering if we'll ever make it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the model, that split level model, mm -hmm. which so many Christians have to this day, and they fill in the gaps with Plato, that we have this soul, we're going to have them sooner or later. And um, then you get different theories about who gets to go and why. And the different theologies of salvation uh, are really worked out within that frame of reference. Um, the Enlightenment produces what is known in the trade as modernism since then really most of the 20th century, but it's only really burst on the scene in the last 40 years, we've had what's called postmodernism, mm -hmm. which is a way of saying all those big stories about how great we are and how special we are and how our knowledge is pure and complete and entire, that's just a power grab. And instead we have a confused world where all sorts of things are going on. And this too becomes a power grab actually, because it's a way of saying we don't like rulers, we don't like systems, we're just gonna do our own thing with all sorts of spin-offs of that. That means it's been very, very confusing as that has struck 
the mainstream cultural life, I think particularly in America, mm. um, and an awful lot of people who are brought up with a sort of conservative modernism, because if you take Plato, he will help you to be a conservative within a modernist framework. Mm -hmm. And so we can believe in a God, and he did give us a Bible, and he did send Jesus, etc., etc. And then, uh, you know, we sort of keep the heretics at bay, but then postmodernity comes along and says, hang on, all this stuff seems to be in the interests of the powerful, in the interests of the Western world, mm -hmm. in the interests of business, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And maybe Jesus himself might have some rebuke to give us on that. Mm -hmm. And so right now, I think we have a lot of people in the younger generation who live in that postmodern world, which says a plague on all your big dreams. Mm -hmm. And they're reading the Bible and something hugely attractive about Jesus, but the frameworks that they're being given yeah. are not helpful as a place to live. And I think it's more or less where we are. Yeah. Now, how is that? Five minute version of modern <laughs> European Perfect. intellectual no, history. No, you nailed it, yeah. The, these are the two red flags that went off as you were talking. One, how could God let that happen? <laughs> you know, how, yeah. Could, yeah. how could, as far as I understand, like pretty early on, there were significant mm -hmm. shifts in understanding of what the soul is and what happens. So that's one red flag, that like how, mm -hmm. how could God mm -hmm. let that happen? And the other red flag is, are you telling me <laughs> that I can't just sit here and open my Bible and read it in English and completely perfectly understand everything that, <laughs> that God was saying? Um, well, if you could, please yeah. let the rest okay. of us know because some of us are quite muddled about you. things. <laughs> I'll email you. <laughs> so those are the two things that I find unsettling as yeah. a very um, individualistic oh, yeah, <laughs> American. Yeah. I want to just be able to open my Bible in English and understand it for all it's worth. And I don't like the fact that, that someone is telling me that things happened a long time ago yeah. that affected drastically affected how yeah. I live out my faith. Yeah. That feels uncomfortable to me. Right, right. Well, I mean, uh, I think it's very interesting. Probably only in the last two or three hundred years would people perceive this as odd, mm. because in the early centuries, the the early Christians were fighting so many battles, and there were so many different ideas flying around, and different groups of Christians would embrace some of them, and what we now look back and call the early heresies, like Marcionism or mm -hmm. indeed Arianism, and and so on. <laughs> um, th these are things which a lot of people really did believe. And I think in retrospect, the people who were arguing about them might have said to us that God allowed that in order to stimulate his people to a deeper grasp of the truth. Hmm. You know, if you hadn't had Arianism, you wouldn't have had Athanasius um, art articulating the theology, which became what we now say in the great creeds, the Nicene and hmm. um, Constantinopolitan creeds, the God of God, light of light, very God of very God, etc. Um, and I would say of anything like that, it is perfectly possible that in the providence of God, um, wrong ideas are allowed to come up precisely in order that people can say, hang on, no, we need to do some more work on that. Because this is one of the things I've found about the Bible throughout my life, that the Bible is never a static book. It's never simply, oh, we can just go and check out this answer and then go back to sleep. The Bible is always stimulating us. And if, if it isn't, then something's wrong. You know, when you read the Psalms or the book of Job or Jeremiah or let alone Paul or Revelation or whatever it may be, if you think that this will all just go straight in and it's all plain sailing, well, I'm sorry, no, mm. you're not taking it seriously. Mm. And um, I think in the modern period in the Western world, we've been greatly infected by a philosopher I didn't mention before called Hegel. Mm. And Hegel believed in this developmental um, scheme that that the world was actually progressing. In fact, the word progress means what it means for us because of him. And I think a lot of Christians imagine, as many did in the 19th century, that actually in the purposes of God, the world is just getting better and better and better, and the kingdom of God will arrive. Now, mm -hmm. the 20th century put a big explosion right. against that. And I want to do the same with any idea that in terms of belief, um, that we all just believe the right stuff and that's, that's what it should be. Um, and I don't want to say that in the way that says everything we believed is wrong, yeah. because grasping onto Jesus and being grasped by him mm. um, remains constant. Mm -hmm. And that's so for many people in many mm -hmm. traditions. And we are all to a lesser or greater extent muddled. Mm -hmm. But Paul says again and again, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that wonderful line in the middle of 1 Corinthians 14, where he says, when it comes to evil, 
I want you just to be little babies. Just mm. don't need to know about that stuff. But in your thinking, I want you to be grown-ups. Yeah. I want you to be mature. And I think that's a word for Western Christianity now. Don't remain at Sunday school level. There is such a thing as grown-up Christian thinking, yeah. and it's good for you. Yeah. And it's part of loving God with your mind. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you very much.